Today we're going to take a look at the third Robotech game from Solar Flare Games, Invid Invasion. Mm -hmm. Before we begin, we do have to thank Solar Flare Games for sending us review copies of all the games in this series. A Robotech Invid Invasion was designed by Dave Killingsworth and features art from Andorra, Sidonia, and Joel Lopez. It was published by Solar Flare Games in 2020, right in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think due to that, really didn't get the exposure it deserves. Like if you look at the Board Game Geek page on this, just like no one owns it, no one's reviewed it, no one's talking about it. Now, Invid Invasion plays one to six players, with the games we played taking two to three hours each. This is... This Robotech-themed game has an MSRP of $50 US. This is the third Robotech game from Solar Flare. Check out our backlog or the blog for reviews of the other two games, Robotech Force of Arms and Robotech Crisis Point. Now, in Robotech Invid Invasions, players take on the roles of four to six Robotech Freedom Fighters from the Robotech The Next Generation series. That was the third series, as well as this being the third game. Now, this game is split into two halves, with the first half having you try to break through the Invid lines and get to Reflex Point. Now, players do this by fighting through a grid of cards to try to create a path from east to west before time runs out. Now, assuming you're able to get to reflex points, you then take on the Invid Regis and her defenders and need to take her out before the expeditionary force has no other choice but to destroy the entire planet to stop the Invid, you included. While playing the game, players will find gear and protoculture, which will enable them to swap mecha in order to improve their odds in battling the Invid. Now, this is the third Robotech game from Solar Flare, and this set of games were created as a series where each successive game would be more involved and more difficult, culminating in Invid Invasion, which we're looking at today. Now, each of the games looks at a different Robotech series. Force of Arms was set in the Macross saga, Crisis Point is during the Robotech Masters series, and Invid Invasion lets you play through the new generation. Now, Dave, the designer of all three games, noted that they wanted to sit down and create a series of games that you could sit down for one Epic Game Night and play through the entire Robotech series. And Epic Game Night would be required as the time for these games ramps up with the difficulty. So even if you've played this before, you're looking at a decent time investment. And yeah. if it's your first time through, all bets are off. Yeah, I got to admit, we, we took pictures and we were doing other social media things while we were playing. So we probably waste a little time, but we were over four hours for our first game. And that's only with two players. If there were six of us debating what to do each turn, it would have been way longer. Now, another thing that's grown with each game in this series from Force of Arms to this one is the box size and the sheer amount of stuff you get with each game. For a good look at just how big the box is for this game, and to see what you get in that box in detail, be sure to check out our Robotech Invid Invasion unboxing video on YouTube. Now, overall, regarding the components, I would say quality is good. Not great, but not bad either. Just good. Now, the board is huge. This is the reason for the rather large size box. Now, it's not overly deep, but it is a rather large size. Um, and the board is a six-fold. Like, this is, this is a bit of a table hop. Now, there are also a huge number of cardboard standees. It's sub above 20, I think, possibly over 30 standees. Um, these did punch well, but the actual small little half circle stands that you have to attach to them did give us some trouble, especially with the little notch in the middle trying to get it out. And it also gave us a bit of a problem assembling them. Some were a little loose. So I ended up actually using glue on absolutely every one of them just to make sure the bases don't come off during play, which just gets annoying. Now, by doing this, I also had to toss out the cardboard box insert to be able to get everything to fit back in the box. But doing that, you can fit it all back in the box. Not that the insert was anything to write home about in the first place. No, it was just a cardboard trough like you find in many games. Now, I will note if you happen to back this on Kickstarter or you bought the miniatures for this game separately, there's no way. They're not going to fit in that box. You have a bunch of miniatures to display somewhere that you're going to have to grab off your shelf to play this game. There is no way they're fitting in the box. Now, with these standees on the punch board are a bunch more cardboard counters. There's a bunch of player boards, as well as a tile for the Regis. Um, everything's two-sided, features some really nice, iconic Robotech artwork. You really can't go wrong with Robotech artwork. Um, you do get a number of cards in this game. I would say this is a card-driven game. Um, and the cards are odd to me because they have that really nice high-end linen finish that you tend to only get in like Fantasy Flight games or really successful Kickstarters. But then the card quality is very thin. 
it just seems kind of odd to have such good quality finish on thin cards. Like they do feel a bit flimsy, but to be honest, this isn't the kind of game where you hold a hand. You don't have a hand of cards. They're just down on the table and you're not shuffling often. You just shuffle at the beginning of the game and that's it. So I don't think you have to worry about the quality of the cards being a problem. I just thought it was odd to have that linen finish with such a thin card. Now, Invasion also comes with 15 custom six-sided dice, a standard D6, and some wood tracker cubes. All in all, a perfectly reasonable, if not high-end, set of components, which is a reasonable trade-off at this price point. Fair enough. Now, finally, though, we do get to the one component issue, and that is the rulebook, which, similar to other games in this series, unfortunately, is a bit of a hot mess. Uh, the layout is terrible. Like, there is a glaring issue right near the start, uh, of the page where you have a sentence and ends part way that says like you and nothing and doesn't continue until three pages later so that you don't you have to flip three pages to find out the end of that sentence uh, there's a section that says pick one of two options and it says one do this and then there's never a two um, added to that there are a number of rules that just aren't clear or downright ambiguous and to be honest, to be fully able to play this game, you're going to have to sit down with your group and decide how you're going to interpret those rules. Now, this is a co-op game. So it, if it's going to happen in any game, I think it's better that it happened in a cooperative game because you're all on the same page, right? So no ruling is going to give any one player an, an, an advantage over anyone else. And you shouldn't get into arguments about what things need because it's going to affect all of you. See, this is a tough one for me. Personally, I have a really hard time supporting a game that can't nail its rules. Mm -hmm. uh, if you as the player want to house rule things in a game, that's fine. We've talked about house ruling plenty of times. Mm -hmm. But if you can't actually play the game without sitting down and, and, and do house rules, is it a complete game? Well, see, this isn't Masters of the Universe, which we reviewed before. And, and if you want an enjoyable read, find that on our blog. You can play this game. Like there are rules for everything in this box. And some of the issues I mentioned are just layout. They're, they're not actually a problem. Even the section where I said there's one option where it says one and there's no two. Well, after that first option, there's a big letter or. So you can see what the other option is. It's just that whoever did the layout of this, you know, created a numbered list and only put the first item and forgot to add the second item. Like I almost wonder if it was written in Word or something, because that's how you end up with paragraphs that end up ending three pages later at least every time i use word it's like that but there are things though that are totally ambiguous and you're going to have possible arguments or at least discussions about them like our first game deanna and i spent a lot of time passing the book back and forth going well i read this and i think it means this what do you think like how do you interpret this okay this is how i interpret this now after our first game uh, besides going online to Board Game Geek and seeing some of the answers from the designer, uh, we were able to sit down and go, okay, this is what we're going to play it like. So we came up with rulings for everything, and we we're easily able to finish the game, though did we play by rules as intended? I have no idea. Right. Yeah. So now that you have some idea of what you get in the box, how about you walk us through how to play all right, start the game of Invid Invasion. You first have to decide which of the Robotech defenders you're going to use. There are six to choose from, and every game you have to use at least four of them, no matter how many players you're playing with. Now, the player playable characters include Rook Bartley, Rand, Scott Bernard, Lancer Belmont, Jim Lunk Austin, and Sue Graham. Note, you can play with only one to six players, but if you play with less than six players, one or more players is going to have to control more than one hero. Like if you're playing solo, you still decide. Like you could play solo with four heroes or you can play solo with six or five. That's totally your choice. But if you have less than six, you are going to have to play more than one character. Now, once you know who's controlling who, you collect all the stuff for that player. So there's a player board, some cards, some standees, turn tokens, mecha, et cetera. You get all your player stuff, put it in front of you. Now, every hero starts in their base mecha, which for most characters is their cyclone. Of course, Lunk has a Jeep, which is shown on the player board. It's like built into it. You're going to use those red cubes that we mentioned in the components, and you're going to track your armor and your dice pool number on this player board. Now, each character also has a unique ability, and each mech has a unique ability. Most of these can be used once per turn. Some of them can be used all the time, and you have little tokens that you flip if you use them. So just an easy way to keep track of have you used your ability or not. So simple enough uh, for player characters and with asymmetry as well. Always nice as listeners of this show know. 
Yeah, the characters are actually very different. Their stats are different. Their abilities are different. They are very unique. And they are very fitting for what the characters did in the show, at least in some cases. So Scott's the leader of the group. His ability is to use anyone else who's at the table at that time's ability, but he can only do it once per other character. So if you have all six characters, Scott's actually more useful. So the more people on his team, the more useful Scott is, which again, fits the series well. Now, once you've chosen your characters, you're going to populate the main board. It's just a big grid. That's it's a grid with a bunch of trackers on it. That's really all the board suffices for. Um, you're just going to fill it with assault cards about based on the number of players. You're going to shuffle the gear cards as a spot to put them. And then you're going to put three trackers on the board. So one of them is to track the game round. There's another one to track the group's protoculture amounts, how much protoculture your team has collected. And then the last one is to track the bro group's protoculture signature total. This becomes very important later. Note it's the total of the protoculture signature. Finally, your players are each going to pick where they want their character to enter on the left west side of the board, and each character has to be in a different row. So the stronger the energy source, the more noticeable it is by the invid, which is that protoculture signature yes. uh, idea. They, 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 the invid are there to find the protoculture. They're there but because of the protoculture. So if you're pumping out a lot of it with your giant mech, they're going to focus on you. Exactly. Now, a game of Invid Invasion, as I mentioned earlier, is broken into two parts. The first phase is the assault phase. Players are trying to break through the Invid lines and reach reflex point. They need to do this before the six-round turn timer runs out. Now, in addition to breaking through, you're also going to want to destroy as many Invid as possible, because any cards left on the board in this stage are going to be replaced by stronger cards in the next phase. The other thing is you got to watch that protoculture signature because each round, all your mecha generates a protoculture signature and that gets added to that total. Well, that total is the main bosses, the Regis's health in the next phase. And those new cards are newer, better troops directly under control of the Regis and less good stuff mixed in for you. Yeah, you're not going to find any allies or gear cards once you're in the Regis phase, just bigger and badder invid in that phase. And when I say bigger and better, you're going to need something better than a, a cyclone to take those out. Now, sticking with the assault phase, we haven't worried, don't worry about the Regis yet. So each turn in the assault phase, your character is going to take actions. Each character has an action dice pool. The size is determined by what mecha they're in. Now, these dice are used to do a number of things, like you spend a die to move one spot, you can spend dice to search for gear and protoculture, you can fight the invid or try to escape from the invid. And they all come from the same pool. Now, one of the things that's fascinating in this game is that you can almost interrupt other players' turns. Not one player has to use their entire dice pool. So I could move, then Sean could use his character to do something, then I can attack an invid, and then Sean could do something else. Like, you don't have to finish your whole turn. And I've never seen that before in a co-op game, and I love it in this, because it really comes up with some interesting ways that your characters can work together. Now, in addition to actions that you spend dice for, there are some you can do for free like using those gear cards you found, using your character or your mech abilities, or flipping over a face-down invent card, because at the beginning, everything's face-down. Now, when you do flip over a card, that might trigger a special ability. So there's things like ambush and spores. Um, you're going to resolve that. I'm not going to get into the details here of exactly what they do, but you're going to resolve that, and then you have to decide right then and there, do you either fight the invid or try to escape? Fighting the invid is simple. But interesting, each invent card has a health number on it. You choose how many of your dice from your dice pool to use, roll that number, and then count out the bangs, the explosion symbols on the dice. If the number of bangs meets or beats the health of the invid, you destroy it, and you get the reward on the card, which is always some protoculture and maybe some gear. Now, if you fail to get enough bangs, you just wasted your dice. Like, there's no ongoing damage. There's no tracking health. You either kill the invid or you don't. Invid? are tough so that's not actually all that unfair invid that aren't defeated will counter attack rolling a number of dice equal to their attack value and doing damage to your armor equal to the number of bangs rolled again you're using the same dice now if at any time your armor hits zero you're ejected from your mecha and can do nothing with that character until the mecha is repaired or you get into a new one now, there is an advantage to being on foot that you might want to take advantage of because you're no longer generating any protoculture signature and the invid won't attack you on foot. The invid have always been pretty one-track minded, so use those, use those uh, sneakers. <laughs> now, instead of fighting an invid, 
you also had the chance to escape. That's your or option. Every invid has an escape rating. You choose the number of dice, you roll, you compare the bangs to the escape rating. If you beat it, you get away. Equal or beat it, you get away. If you fail, the invid counterattacks. Basically the same way as combat, but smaller. You, it, they're usually a lot easier to escape than to defeat. Now, along with all this, the attacking and escaping, there's this whole thing with engage and attack tokens for tracking which invid or fighting which characters, and you can't move away if you're engaged, but I don't want to get into all the details here. That's just a little bit too much for, for this type of review. Plus, there's a thing like invid spore clouds. Uh, you know what? Pick up the game, try it out for yourself. You'll figure out what the spore clouds do. I, I just don't want to get into the details about them degrading every turn and stuff like that. So it's a simple combat system, but there's so much more going on around that combat system that makes it interesting. Yeah, I really like the push. I think you'd love the push your luck element, but how many dice do I use? Like, do I, he's got four health. Do I use four dice? I got a pretty good chance. Or do I throw five or do I throw six to hope I get it? Or do I just roll three dice or two dice and hope I get a double bang roll? So it's definitely an interesting thing. Now I will note one thing thematically. I keep saying image cards. Not all the Invid cards are actually Invid. Many of the cards are things like Invid sympathizers and other obstacles that Scott and his crew face during the anime series. Now, in addition to discovering the Invid, some of the cards are actually allies or caches of gear. Now, when you do that, you're going to collect the ally, you're going to get the gear, but then you're always going to replace it by the new assault card off the deck. And then you're still going to encounter some form of Invid. Now, these allies work like gear and break the rules in some way, but they don't take up gear slots because you can only hold three gear. But again, that's a little bit more minutia than I think we need to get into here. So you might get something good, but you don't get away scot-free. <laughs> You're still fighting something along the way. Yeah, no matter what, because even if you drew another ally, it would say the same thing. You'd collect it and then draw another card. You are going to face an invader, a sympathizer, some type of enemy at some point. Now, while battling your way across the board, you can spend protoculture that you've gotten from beating up Invid or for searching. These can be spent to do a number of things like changing the form of your mecha. Because at the beginning of the game, you have your cyclone and your cyclone has its bike form and its armored form. Once you're in the second half of the game, there's more mecha. Uh, you could just get into a new mecha instead of repairing ones. You can repair your mecha. You can reroll dice. Um, there's even a way where you can spend a ton of it to lure an Invid to your location to possibly clear a path or to get taking something out. Now, swapping mecha is a big part of this game. And usually when you swap mecha, it means more armor and more dice and thus more actions every round, as well as providing some kind of new special ability. Though I thought it was interesting that a lot of the base special abilities seem better than the other mecha. So I think by getting the additional dice and armor, you're kind of giving up a really good power. Now, when swapping mecha and when getting knocked out of your mech on foot, you are meant to switch the standee you're using, which is why there are so many. Every character actually has five different standees that you could swap out during the game. Now, this doesn't have any mechanical effect, but it just looks cooler when everyone's in their proper mecha on the board. So, protoculture is just energy. So, you can think of it as action points with a fancy name. Yeah. It all makes sense using it that way. Now, after all characters have spent their dice and used their gear and abilities and protoculture they want to, you then move on to the invid phase. And no, this isn't the second phase of the game. I apologize. That's It's a sub part of the assault phase. As noted, the rule book's not as clear by using the term phase for two different things. But in the invid phase, you start by checking to see if you've made it clear. So the first thing you do is look, is there a path east to west? Is there a line with no cards? If you did it, you made it to the Regis phase and you jump over there right now. You don't finish the rest of the phase now assuming you haven't cleared the path any engaged invid will attack the characters they're engaged with any non-engaged invid will move towards the nearest character and engage them um, if there's ever any ties they'll go for the person with the highest protoculture signature and then when invids attack it's the same combat system as that happened during a player turn same counter attack system except now they're attacking and that's the first time where that protoculture signature comes in you want to be less noticeable by the invid although if you're the big tank with lots of armor maybe you want to be the most noticeable and that is an aspect of the game now after all the invid attacks are done you're going to use that protoculture signature again every single person's mecha has a signature rating some of the gear like missiles have a signature rating you're going to add all those up and you're going to add it to the protoculture signature tracker again i wish they had better names but it's the tracker that's on the board now this number 
it just gets added to, right? So at the end of the round, you're going to go, okay, I got five, six. And most of our games, it was between 11 and 15 at the beginning of the game. And it really ramped up later in the game. And you're going to up that level. Finally, there's a little bit of cleanup at the end of the thing regarding the spore clouds, um, the attack tokens flip back over to the engage side. And more importantly, you move the round marker one spot. Now, if that round marker hits the last space, which is a nice skull and crossbones, the game is over. It's considered if you lose during the asphalt phase that the characters are overwhelmed by Invid. Eventually, the Earth is destroyed by the expeditionary force in space coming in from Jupiter. And this is why you always want to use your shadow technology and let those Invids know you have the power to scare <laughs> off the forces of the Regis. Now, once your brave characters have punched a line through the Invid forces in the assault phase, it's time to move to the Regis phase. This is the actual second part of the game. Now, this starts by counting up any remaining assault cards on the board, face up or face down, then clearing it. You're also going to reset the round marker to the start of the track. You then reset up the board using the Invid, putting the Regis in the middle, which is a, a two, takes up two spot tile. Uh, you're going to surround it by Korg and Sarah, which are two named Invid, two Genesis pits, and two pit creatures. And this way you make a complete circle around the Regis. So there's no direct route to her. You're then going to draw a number of Regis cards based on the number of assault cards you cleared. So whatever was left over from last phase become better cards. You're then going to further surround the Regis with these, which is just this like spiral pattern you follow. Sarah and Korg, technically being brother and sister created by the Regis after the disappearance of Princess Ariel, uh, also yes. known as, uh, what's her name? Um, I mentioned it later Miriam, and I'm yeah, drawing Miriam, a Melinda, Melinda? I'm drawing a blank. Shoot. It's terrible. Oh, my bad. All right. Marlene. 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 Yes, Princess Ariel, better known to Marlene by the characters. Uh, but for people who don't know the plot, the at this point, the Regis had determined that the ultimate form of being on the planet were humans, so started converting her self first and then her progeny into humanoid form. Now, the goal of this phase is for your team to defeat the Regis. Now, remember, as mentioned earlier, the Regis's health is equal to the protoculture signature tracker level. So the more protoculture signature you generated during the assault phase, the tougher the Regis is going to be now. And along with that, any changes to protoculture signature now are actually affecting her health directly. So if you start gaining protoculture signature, she's gaining health. And if you lose protoculture signature, she's losing health. Now you're going to take the party, you're going to split it. I know they say never split the party, but you're going to split the party evenly. And everyone's got to decide which side they start on, either the east or the west side of the Regis. But you're always coming in from two fronts. You're then going to put your character standees on empty spots and then start going through the, the next phase. Now, one last thing you can do is the character's fighter mecha are now unlocked. These are the, the ships, the alphas and the betas. At the start of the Regis phase, everyone can spend protoculture to upgrade to their new mecha, picking between one of the two forms, Guardian or Battleoid. And this has no protoculture signature cost at all at this point whereas if you're in the phase and you get into these mecha you are going to generate a significant amount of protoculture jumping into these new mecha so i strongly recommend anyone playing this game make sure you have at least enough protoculture saved up to get all of your characters into their final mechs before getting to this fight showing up to the final battle with no protoculture is a bad idea yes yeah, a lot of the second half is dependent on what you did in the first half now, once everything's set up, the rest of this phase plays pretty much similar to the assault phase, except the Regis, Korg, and Sarah each have their own special actions that happen in a very specific order. Now, every round, the Regis is going to act. You roll a die and see what the Regis does. Sarah is going to generate some spore counters on the board. And it's only after those two things happen the players even get to go. Uh, now, the player actions are the same as in the previous phase. However, in the Regis phase, everything's ramped up. Now, assuming your characters now in their alpha beta fighters, the dice pools are going to be way bigger. Like when you're on a cyclone, you're looking at a dice pool like six, seven. When you're in one of these big mecha, you're looking at 13, 14 dice instead. I think Shadowrun and Champions players would dig this phase of this game. But along with this, the invid you're facing have tons of health. Like Korg has 14, 15 and Sarah has 14 and the pit monsters have seven and nine. So it's just kind of everything ramps up. It's more epic because it's the big final battle. And I got to say, there's something to be said for throwing that handful of dice on the table. Now, after the players act, you're going to check the protoculture signature tracker. If it's at zero, you win. You have defeated the Regis and saved the earth. Now, if it's not zero, you're going to keep playing. 
So now you've all gone, the Regis has gone, Sarah's gone. Now the invid on the board are going to move and attack. Again, similar to the way they act in the assault phase, engaged are going to attack, and ones that aren't engaged are going to move and become engaged and so on. Once all them have gone, then Korg does a special attack, which is nasty. It's a six die attack against the person with the highest health. After all invid attacks, you then do the whole adding up the protoculture signature thing. So now you're in your bigger mechs, probably. You're probably going to generate a lot more, and you're going to add that to the tracker. And again, you're giving health back to the Regis because she thrives on protoculture. Finally, you got some cleanup stuff. Again, spore tokens degrade, attack tokens are flipped to engage, and the round marker is moved up. And so on, and so on, and so on. Yes. Though not too many so on. Six maximum. Because the game continues until either the Regis is defeated and you win, or the round marker reaches the end of the track and the game is over. Again, this represents the expeditionary force is left with no choice but to destroy the entire Earth to destroy the Invid. Now, at this point, I want to state that Robotech is cool. Like, really cool with a huge cannon. Mm -hmm. As such, we actually spent a good deal of time looking at wikis and forums and actually analyzing episodes to figure out a couple of things that don't really change the gameplay at no. all, but how one is interpreting the gameplay and how it fits or doesn't into canon. Yeah, there are some definitely interesting design choices here. But before I get into that, I just want to mention the other games in the series, right? So I will say that I was a bit disappointed by the first two Robotech games released by Solar Flare. They weren't bad games. It just it didn't give me what I wanted. So Force of Arms is a rather simple mass game based game that's extremely short. Like you can finish a game in 15 minutes. Like this is a quick filler more than a full gaming experience. It's fun for what it is, but it didn't give me an epic Robotech feel. Now Robotech Crisis Points, while featuring some similar mechanics to Force of Arms, was a much deeper, more involved game. It was also much more enjoyable and engaging than Force of Arms. But it did have a fair share of rough edges, including a rather ambiguous rulebook. Now, the other thing I found with both of these games, it just didn't feel like I was playing Robotech, right? It felt like I, either of them could have been rethemed to anything. I could have been battling Pokemon. I could have been having a space battle. I could have been I, I, throwing darts or something. Like, I honestly think either of those games could easily be rethemed to pretty much any license or just played as an abstract game. They didn't even have to have names on them. It could have just said, add, remove tokens. But there are very few Robotech games, and fans will generally take whatever they can get. And again, I will note they were both decent games. They just didn't give me that feel I wanted. Now, with Robotech Invid Invasion, we finally have a game that actually feels like I'm taking on the role of Robotech Defenders, facing off against near insurmountable odds. In Invid Invasion, you're playing a small band of rebels who are facing and trying to break through an army of invid in order to reach reflex point and then defeat the invid regis along the way you're going to swap swap your cyclones into the more powerful armored suit version or armoring up your jeep if you happen to be lunk uh you'll come across allies like annie and marlene and you'll have to deal with invid super sympathizers and even the outlaw dusty airs makes an appearance in this game so while there are some questionable canon aspects to this game, there are in the show as well. Mm -hmm. And that's so that's ultimately forgivable in a game that otherwise feels so much more like Robotech than other games in its yeah. uh, ilk. I agree, especially with the assault phase. That really does bring back memories of watching Scott Bernard's band track across the land always trying to find a path to reflex point uh, the driving thing right from the first episode of the show is scott must make it to reflex point. well there are some odd inconsistencies right like for example there are two dusty airs cards both of which can be on the board at the same time and while well, you can defeat dusty airs twice which uh, it's a one episode character or even more so the one that bothered me the most re-watching the show was sue is a combatant well, Sue in the movie would just recorded video. And why is she a combatant? Like, but even with these inconsistencies, the assault phase just felt like playing through an epic Robotech story. So fans really do have a good bit to draw them in there. Now, sadly, this thematic tie-in falls apart quite a bit in the Regis phase. 
So the second phase of Invid Invasion is all about battling the Regis' guards, trying to take her down while dealing with other threats like the Genesis Pits. Now, what you aren't going to see here is Sarah conflicted over her feelings for Lancer, or the group convincing the Regis to just leave the planet. They never defeat her in the series, they just convince her to leave. Instead, you have this huge, epic boss-style fight, which oddly features, among other things, the Genesis Pits, which was a one-episode obstacle the group dealt with long before they reached Reflex Point and had nothing to do with the final battle. And then we get to some flights of fancy or stretching of cannon. Yeah, it's, there's some definite unique choices here. But I think I get it. Right, uh, Dave, the designer, took some artistic liberties here. Uh, I'm sure he wanted to add the Genesis pits, right? Like, here's this thing there. You find an old Earth. It's a lost world thing where there's prehistoric monsters and dinosaurs. And what's better than mechs fighting dinosaurs, right? And I got to say, like, interpersonal conflict is a huge part of the series, but it really wouldn't fit with this game, which is more of a dice chucker, right? This is a, all about defeating Invid. And I got to say, like, attacking her the regis at the end just fits with the mechanics instead of having a convince her to leave mini game at the end which i admit would probably feel really out of place here even though it might be more thematic like i i honestly i can forgive these inconsistencies and i gotta say it though it just was really glaring because i played this and i'm like oh man my memory of next generation is great so i'm gonna rewatch it and i rewatch the whole thing and then we played again and i was just like Oh, wow. Okay. First time I didn't notice these issues, but now that I just watched the show like a couple hours ago, it, it's kind of glaring. And it doesn't help that we don't know if the games were based purely off of the TV series or if they were the comics or even considered non-canon material like the Palladium source books, which some people think of as canon, but aren't considered such. So I, I actually thought those were canon at the time, just kind of like the old West End game Star Wars books were canon. But yeah, I honestly don't know. All I'm basing this off of is the original TV series. The the I don't remember how many episodes. It's like 60-some episodes. So, Well, if you count all three series... No, no, I'm just talking about just the next generation. Oh, yeah. So it's uh, it's only actually 20 26 or so? 26, oh, right. But still, it's yeah, yeah. 26 episodes. Now, what I can't forgive here, though, is the Invid Invasion rulebook. Um, as I mentioned earlier, when talking about what you get in the box, it's it's not good. Um, there's glaring layout issues, large number of unclear, ambiguous rules. Um, and even worse, most of them don't come up until you're in that Regis phase. So like the first half of the game felt great and it played really well. And then you get to the second phase and it felt like we were constantly looking up stuff in the rulebook and then having to make rulings. Like stuff like is every encounter card that's not an ally an invid? If every encounter card is an invid, do the Genesis puts move and engage like an invid trooper? If they don't, why do they have an escape rating? Like it just inconsistencies just didn't make sense. There's also a huge issue with the engagement. And, and as the designer pointed out, pits don't move. And I'm like, yeah, but that doesn't tell me why they have an engagement rating. There's just some definite issues with this rule book. And as I mentioned earlier, I do strongly suggest before playing your first game, if you can, sit down as a group and decide how you're going to interpret them. Now, it's going to be difficult if you haven't played yet, so you may not know what they are, but pre be prepared for that. Be prepared to pause the game, sit down, have a conversation, make a ruling and moved on. And I got to say, I, I got another 80s flashback when I was doing this because I was remembering playing, say, Warlock of Firetop Mountain or, or Talisman 2nd Edition and coming up with these rules that like, wait, is it the Crown of Command let you do this or this? And you just had to come up with something because it wasn't like there was an internet to look up or you couldn't go find an FAQ online. You were just forced to find a rule and play by that. So in a way, it does bring back that 80s nostalgia that way, too. And I think I've said my piece on what I think of the broken rule books. <laughs> Now, perhaps due to these rule ambiguities, um, it's possible Deanna and I broke the game, in a manner of speaking. After a couple of plays, I noticed there didn't seem to be any reason to actually keep your mecha repaired. Now, spending protoculture doesn't cost any dice, so you can do it anytime as long as it's your turn. Plus, when dealing damage, excess damage, so when, when you get hit, if you take way more damage than you have armor, you just you lose the difference, right? So if I only have six armor and I take 10 hits, I still only lose six armor and I go to zero. The rest is wasted. Due to this, I honestly don't see why you couldn't just keep everyone's mecha at one armor all the time. 
Like you wouldn't start at one, you'd have to get knocked down to one, but you get attacked for 10 damage. You take one damage and the rest is lost. That's all wasted. Then after the attack, no more invid will attack you because you're now out of your mech and you're on foot. And you have zero protoculture signature, so you're not giving the Regis health. Then next turn, it comes back. You spend one protoculture to repair your mech to one health. You get all your dice pulled back, and you can take all your actions again. Now, if you happen to hit zero through a counterattack, you again spend one protoculture to repair and continue your turn. The only worry you have with this is running out of protoculture, but you probably, if you weren't doing this, are going to be spending nine and 10 and six to repair your mech every turn. Like, I think you're actually going to use less protoculture this way than you would if you tried to keep everyone healed all the time. Now, maybe I'm missing something here. Like I said, the rules aren't the clearest, but I'm not sure what. So if you've played Robotech Invid Invasion, and I got to admit, looking at board game geek ratings and that, I don't think a lot of you have. But if you have played this and can see any reason why this won't work, please let me know. Now, what I will say is once we did discover this, once I figured this out, we decided not to use it because it seemed really unthematic. Like, oh, all these half beat up mechs that we just barely jury rate to keep fighting seemed dumb. And it kind of felt like cheating. But I still can't see why it wouldn't work based on the raw rules as written. And while there are some clarifications of rules on Board Game Geek, not everything is addressed and some things are addressed uh, less than adequately. Yeah, I agree. Now, despite these rulebook issues and the fact that Regis phase kind of breaks from canon completely, um, we've had a lot of fun playing this game, like way more than I thought I would. That assault phase is really fun. It is particularly fun and engaging. Every time we've run through it, it's been completely different just due to the randomness of the cards and trying out different characters every time. I still haven't used all six, I'll admit it. Uh, we've just been doing groups of four characters, two each, and swapping up who's playing who. Um, well, we've only played with low player counts with everyone controlling more than one. I have. I just I picture playing this specifically at uh, the local game store uh, so I picture it different because they move and I don't even know what it looks like in there. I picture the old, old uh, CG realm when they were on the corner at Tecumseh and, and uh, Hall there and, and like having six people playing and I could see other people standing around watching us play to see what happens and like with the standees and it just feels like this epic fun event and people who know the series quoting it and talking about all kinds of different aspects of the show. And, Oh, I remember seeing him and you flip up an invid card and you're like, Oh, look, it's dusty Ears. Remember when dusty Ears did this? I just think that would be an epic game night. I really want to play this at the FLGS in public with other Robotech fans. Yeah. I have to say, I commented on Twitter during your uh, play posts about this mm -hmm. not being all that interesting to me. But going through this review and in part doing the research on Robotech and, and rewatching mm -hmm. some episodes and digging through the wiki has given me a lot more interest in it. Yep. Though definitely at the higher player counts where you can have more fun rather than taking it too seriously as a two player, you know, adventure and, and focused down optimizing sort of thing. optimizing though i think you have to if you're gonna win this by the end round so i don't know we'll have to decide that that'll be my final question we wrap up here do we add this to the sean must play it <laughs> games because i know you weren't expecting much at all from this no. and we're expecting a pretty negative review and i'll admit before sitting down and playing it i i did have my misgivings now the one thing i don't want to do and i have no interest in doing is playing through all three games in a row that dave supposedly designed it for that like while the first two games are rather short like force of arms is dead short this is not a quick game like every game we have played has blown away the 120 minute play time listed on the box like we haven't even come close one game lasted over four hours and that's with only two people like throw six people arguing about what to do and it's just going to be even longer the other thing that i just think would be weird is like you set this up as an epic game night, right? But the first two games are two player only. So you're just going to play two players in, in the first game, two players in the second, then this is six. That's just kind of weird for an epic game night. Where are you going to get those other players? Are you, do you need three copies of Force of Arm and everyone pairs off so that all six join together at the end? I don't know. It's just kind of weird. It, it, it's, a, it's a weird idea that they changed player counts. And the other thing is the first two games were competitive, right? So it's head-to-head. -head. It's Zentradi versus the RDF. And then the next game is the um, Army of the Southern Cross versus the Masters. No, this is everyone versus the game, the Invid. It just seems like an odd thing to play those games in a series. I, I get the idea, Dave. I think it's a, it's a cool concept, but I can't see doing it. Yeah, as opposed to three in a row, I think the games each hit a different market nicely. 
uh, with the light filler, a bit more of a robust two player, and mm-hmm. then that big group battle game. Yep. No, I agree. I, they definitely th- cater to three different crowds while trying to cater to the Robotech fans. Overall, I, I think it's pretty obvious. I'm impressed. Um, well, the rule book uh, could be clearer, and there's some interesting artistic liberties taken with the plot and the story that deviate from the series it's based on. This is the first board game I played that feels like I'm taking part in a Robotech story. If you're looking for Robotech in board game form, you know how people like to say, that, like, this is Star Wars, the board game. This is Star Trek, the board game. This is Robotech, the board game. This is the first place you should look if you're looking for a Robotech board game. Out of the games I played, there are others out there I haven't tried. Now, of all the Robotech games from Solar Flare, this is the one that most feels like you're part of a Robotech epic story. Well, it has some issues. I think this one is worth any Robotech fan picking up. Robotech gamer, get this game. And then go review it because no one's talked about it everywhere. Give it a rating somewhere. Like, Like no one knows about this game. Now, where I wouldn't recommend this game is for gamers who aren't Robotech fans. If you don't care about Robotech, there's nothing totally new here. There's nothing really innovative. It's just another board game, right? Uh, I like some of the mechanics. I like the push your luck dice pool system. I love that you could interrupt each other's actions, like seeing that in a co-op game. Can you imagine like playing Horrified where like you could take one action and someone else could take theirs and you finish up at the end of the round? Oh, it'd be great. But I don't think that's alone is enough to sell this game. Uh, this is for Robotech fans. It's a Robotech game for Robotech gamers. Yeah. Plus, with its complexity, I don't think it's a Robotech game for Robotech non-gamers. In that case, go look at Force of Arms or possibly Crisis Point. If you dig those, then maybe step up to this one. All right, well, read more about Robotech Invid Invasion. You can check out our written review over at tabletopbellhop.com. 